So, this topic. What were you like when you were nine years old? Or what was it like to be you when you were nine? And I just picked nine because that's the age that I've been personally feeling into 60 years ago, literally, from where I am today at 69. Um, and um, you're, if you don't have good memories about being nine years old, it's okay. If that whole period was super traumatic for you and, you're, and you don't even want to think about it, it's okay to reflect on maybe other times in your life uh, in terms of what we're going to be doing here. Uh, and it's okay as well if you don't have a lot of clarity about what it was really like to be you. Just in just asking the question can be really, really useful. But first I want to explain the method, in quotes, behind my madness here. And the thing is, on the one hand, as the Buddha taught, we are each inherently, every phenomenon is a collection of parts that are connected and changing over time. So there's this sort of eddy in a stream, a swirling pattern in a stream of reality that is everything, whether it's a skyscraper, a cloud, or a thought, or a life. And still, there is some loose continuity. I can look back and see earlier versions of myself going all the way back to nine and even younger, and there's some continuity there. And there are, I think, values. And I say this as both a psychologist and someone who's, you know, had a pretty unhappy childhood, uh, not a horrible, kind of a C minus, you know, overall for all kinds of reasons, including some having to do with myself. In any case, you know, I've really looked hard at the whole childhood thing and I have some expertise in child development and early childhood. So I'm bringing that to bear, both the, my psychologist background and my personal background and a real interest in the a Buddhist perspective on a, our developmental trajectory which is not anything I've ever encountered in the Buddha Dharma, uh, in any magazine like Tricycle or Buddha Dharma um, or um, Lion's Roar, nor from any teacher. So I just thought it'd be really interesting, really interesting to explore. So I kind of want to, I'll open this up with a little bit of self-disclosure. And as I talk somewhat about myself, you might find ways into this topic for yourself too. So, nine years old, you know, roughly what year was that? You know, and in my case, that was 60 years ago. So, 2022, whatever that is, you know, 1962, roughly. Uh, I turned, uh, uh, I was nine during most of 1962. I turned 10 toward the end of that year, born in 1952. And I grew up in suburban Los Angeles, West Covina, if you have any interest in that, on the edge of rolling foothills and tracked homes laid on top of the earth and the orange groves that were there. So already in my circumstances was a sense of living in a kind of invented world. Intact family, two parents, Fairly, I mean, loving, decent, definitely loving, decent people, you know, a fairly harmonious home. It's a certain amount of bickering between my parents. I'm the oldest of three kids. Uh, fairly straightforward life. Um, went to school. Uh, I skipped a grade and I have a late birthday. So um, much of when I was nine, I was in fifth grade and I started sixth grade also when I was nine years old. Something kind of wild there. And, uh, you know, that was me. I was kind of a quiet kid, sort of shy, uh, who really liked being outdoors and reading and being left alone and getting off his parents' radar. So for you, you know, this is a very important age, by the way, developmentally, you know, nine plus or minus two years, roughly. It's that age when we're really starting to come into our own self-awareness we're becoming a lot more clear about what's going on around us, good news and bad news, and we're not yet swept away by the currents and storms of adolescence. All right. So you might it's a really interesting time to go back there. What was it like to be you? Now, one thing you can look at, apart from your circumstances, 
and the pressures on you was, what kind of a kid were you? And notably, and I think you'll find this when you look back, what were the strengths in you already present and also developing when you were that kid, you know, eight years old, 10 years old, nine years old in your situation, what was it like to be you? Were you kind of, did you have a warm heart? Did you have caring feelings for other people? Maybe a pet, a dog, you know? And I think for so many of us who doubt our own worth and our own goodness, uh, it's really wonderful to get in touch with yourself as a child. Uh, most of us do have some memories of what it was like to be nine, you know. Uh, there may not be very many memories of that period or even younger, but some sense. But if it isn't present, that's okay. You might have an intuition of what it was like to be you. So what were some of your strengths as a nine-year-old? Like I said, a warm heart. Um, you know, when I look back at that time, one of the things that really starts to come forward was the development of a growing self-reliance. That's a topic that's very central in the Buddha Dharma. I, the Buddha's last words, more or less, were, um, you know, things fall apart, tread your path with care and with conscientiousness and with wholeheartedness. Things fall apart. It's up to you. Tread your path with care. Uh, it's not about uh, finding some kind of, uh, in, you know, infinite wisdom around you that you can have faith in. It's like, it's up to us. It's up to us to um, deal with our karmas, deal with the consequences of previous choices we've made and the effects of you know, events in our life. And it's up to us to walk the higher road every day as best we can. So there's that principle of self-reliance. It's very, very central uh, to Buddhism, which was a, a powerful critique and rebuttal to the religious traditions of his time, which focused on the power of the priests and the power of the Brahmins, the gods, and the power of, of ritual offerings, of merit, somehow to earn you a better rebirth, a better life the next time around. You know, it's very other power, very externalized. And the Buddha really said, no, it's about intentional effort and not about are you born into this caste or that caste, but no, what kind of virtuous efforts do you make in this life? How can you rely on yourself? While, of course, in relationship with others. So when I look back, there was a certain developing stubbornness, a certain determination, a certain feeling of, yeah, it's my life, <laughs> you know, kind of an ownership. I wanna do what I can. So that was a strength. How about you? What were some of your strengths present, you know, as a nine-year-old? That's really good to, what did you like to do? That's also really important. What did you enjoy? Did you have hobbies? Did you like to read? Were you, were you really into sports? Did you collect things? Did you have friends? Did you have particular TV shows maybe you liked when you were nine years old? When you went to sleep at night, what were the kinds of things that you liked to think about, fantasize about, imagine? Also, what was painful or difficult for you, just factually? What was hard? What was challenging? Uh, in my family, there was a sense of needing to be distant from my parents, uh, which I'm sure I overdid, but I was a kid still, I probably overdid it. That said, there was a distance because I, I felt like if I let my parents into my world really quickly, they would start to advise and control them and criticize me. So there was that sense of distance, a wistful longing in me or a greater closeness. Um, I didn't feel very popular at all. I was shy, I was young, I was an outsider. So going to school wasn't 
frightening around being bullied, but there was just this sense of, I didn't matter. And that was difficult and painful. How about for you? Were there any things that were especially hard? Were there key turning points for you? Maybe events that occurred? Maybe your family moved? Maybe someone, um, you know, died and that was really tragic? So what was it like to be you? And then I, I want to name a couple of themes from developmental psychology and then start to bring it forward in terms of continuity. A couple of major themes from the work of Daniel Levinson, who did some just wonderful groundbreaking work on adult development. One theme he talks about that runs through people's lives is their dreams. Not what they do when they fall asleep, although that too, but the vision, the dreams they had for the life they wanted to have when they were young, including as young as nine, if not even younger, certainly by adolescence, what dreams did you have for your life? What hopes, what interests? And how have those themes, those dreams, run through your life and guided you and been a major influence? Vision, dreams. And Levinson talks about issues with, on the one hand, getting trapped in particular dreams that are not realistic or there just, isn't, there just aren't the causes and conditions for them. But on the other hand, many of us, and this you know, certainly was true for me in some ways, have a dream, but we're afraid to pursue it. We're afraid to, be, to, to give our whole heart to it uh, and be disappointed or fail. Or we're afraid to reveal to others what our dreams are because they'll criticize our dreams or steal them or attack us for them uh, or puncture them like a balloon pop or a bubble popping if we tell our big brother or our teacher or our parent a dream we have. So what dreams did you have when you were young? And what continuity have they had? And what's your relationship with them today? And, and I personally think it's really valuable to take a breath and to listen to your soul, listen to your innermost being talking to you, um, your innermost wisdom to, that speaks to us. And listen, is it telling you that there's something important to prioritize in the remaining, you know, years and days of your life before it's too late? Is there a calling in you of any kind that's really important to listen to and to see if there are ways to honor, even if you dishonor it for 15 minutes a day? Is there something important to honor that was there in your vision of, of your life and your future and what you hoped for when you were a kid? That's a super powerful question, very important. In the Buddha's life story, it's interesting. Um, he talks about, as best we gather from the record, uh, that as he was approaching his own awakening and really struggling with essentially, what's the point of these painful, painful uh, ascetic practices I'm doing? Why am I doing them? You know, in a context in which somehow the presumption was that the path of liberation was completely leaving um, this life. Uh, and certainly, you know, semi-starving himself to death. And then he started to reflect on this experience he had when he was a kid. Um, who knows how old he was when he had it, but essentially there was a festival and he sat beneath some trees and he dropped into a very blissful state of well-being, a jhana perhaps, um, deep meditative absorption with, with happiness and rapture and bliss and great calm and ease and stability. It could well be, and he realized that was wholesome. That pleasure was wholesome. There was nothing wrong with that pleasure. And that was a major turning point that he talks about in his own realization. And I think, to maybe add a little bit to the account, that 
he got in touch then with a sense of what was possible in a very wholesome way. That was all right. It was okay to, to rest our being in these beautiful states of awareness and, and states of consciousness, really, states of consciousness, and just rest there. That's okay. So even the Buddha, too, I think, had some sense, perhaps, of a vision of the possible. That's a definition of a dream that he had when he was young that charted his course. What vision of the possible did you have when you were young? I mean, I, I've always had a vision, I, honestly, and I think so many people do, of a world in which people live in peace. Whether that's the world in our immediate neighborhood or the schoolyard or classroom or our family's living room or widening out from there, you know, a vision of the possible. Oh, maybe you've had a vision of deep inner peace inside yourself as a vision of the possible. Oh, it's possible to be stably rested in inner peace with a loving heart. Oh, yeah. and dusting off that dream, honoring it, taking a fresh look at it and, and wondering, okay, what would it be like to, to give myself over to that dream? that maybe you had when you were young. Perhaps it's a dream of making music or making art uh, or being significant in the life of a child. And perhaps it just hasn't turned out to have biological children of your own, and yet maybe at this age and stage, there are ways, for example, to honor a dream, perhaps you had when you were young, to be really significant and, and helpful, helpful, trim, potentially really transformational in, in the life of a child, perhaps. So I'm just naming a variety of things under the, the flagging of, of dream. A second major theme from Daniel Levinson about adult development that goes back to childhood is the role of mentors. Mentors come in different forms. Some of them we've never met. We just have read them or watched them or we know their story or maybe we saw a YouTube a TED talk, I don't know. And we go, wow, yeah. Um, mentors for me often were fictional characters. I read a lot of science fiction, uh, including from Robert Heinlein. And in there's a recurring theme in his stories of a kind of a crusty person uh, who is advising some kind of younger person. And the crusty person had a lot of good practical wisdom. Uh, it's kind of cynical, but you know, had a good heart and was really focused a lot on the path of self-development, of learning, of training. So for me, those were mentors when I was young and I've had other mentors along the way. Who were your mentors when you were nine or a young kid or later on? Who have been your mentors? Have there been any issues with mentors? I had some mentors in my um, mid-20s that were in charge of half a cult. <laughs> and that was not good. They were exploitive. Uh, they looked all shiny and they were charismatic, but at the end of the day, uh, they were you know, in it for themselves. That was a problem. Uh, you know? So what's been your story of mentorship? Have you been able to find teachers and teachings and even communities of people that have had a mentor-like um, helpfulness for you. Guiding, encouraging, modeling, inspiring, aiding. Okay. Who have you had along your way, including in your own personal path of awakening? And today, these days, are there people that you could look to who could mentor you in perhaps some capacities um, I have people who uh, I reach out to for, in effect, mentoring related to some things I'm doing in my career. And I have other people that I go to as meditation mentors. Uh, they're you know, farther along in some regards and in that particular regard. And so I am mentored by them. I like it you know, in informal ways. I get a lot of great mentoring from my two kids. And I'm saying this on the recording. So Laurel and Forrest, wherever you are, this is going out to you. I get good mentoring from my kids. 
dad, <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> oh, that was good. Or my wife, you're eating that? <laughs> <laughs> I get mentoring from there too. So right now, who are your mentors or who could be? And you know that you could lean on a little more in ways that would be helpful, including in your own personal practice. Okay. So I think I've planted some seeds here. I want to scan the chat and maybe we'll see some people who might want to talk with me a bit. Um, I'm not, this is a kind of topic territory that naturally you know, it would be easy to just spend a lot of time with one person on. So I'm going to try to avoid doing that. Uh, but, you know, definitely some time with multiple people, if at all possible. So I'm going to do a quick scan here. I love all this wonderful commentary about things that were happening for you, um, you know, and being honest about what it was really like. Uh, that's great. You know, I just see someone here. Um, who talks about this is an important one at 6:58 p.m. from Begum, Virgi, if I'm pronouncing it. I wanted to be a helper teacher. Dreams came true for me. Then Rob says, "I dreamt of being a pilot or an astronaut. Never happened." And a really important point here is we tend to, as a kid, because we're typically pretty concrete at nine, uh, certainly, we tend to think in terms of concrete terms. Like, oh, I wanted to be a geologist or an astronomer. That I liked rocks and I liked outer space. Okay. That never happened for me either. So it didn't happen for me, Rob. You know, I'm not a geologist or an astronomer. But in that was something important for me that I was able to find elsewhere, which is a real interest in penetrating into the, the essence of things, the deep nature of things that you find in a rock right? In a rock. What is this? How is it made? What, what's the stuff that make a rock? You know, I was like, what is that? And also a, a real interest in um, exploration. What's possible? What's possible, right? So I've been able to some extent to scratch that itch, to, to fulfill that. So the key point here is that often our dreams, if they're overly concrete, it's really useful to ask yourself, what was the larger purpose that the concrete vision in the dream served, right? And to whatever extent it was fulfilled, can we acknowledge that? Or to whatever extent it was not fulfilled, acknowledge that. And then ask ourselves now, all right, is there something about being a pilot or an astronaut? Uh, maybe with a sense of adventure. You know, I think that one of the central qualities that's implicit in Buddhist practice and practice in general, but is not foregrounded, is playfulness and adventure. Most, right, most psychotherapy, most uh, spiritual practice, it just seems <laughs> sort of grim and boring a lot, right? Kind of like, Arr. how playful, where did the playfulness go, right? Playfulness. Neurologically, we learn better when we're playful. And also adventure. Wow, adventure. What's possible? Don't know. Just to sit in the mind of don't know is full of adventure. So it's a key question. Could maybe your vision for your life had aspects in it of playfulness or adventure? I'm just tossing that out there. That's definitely common, you know, in nine-year-olds, you know, kids like that. There's a playfulness and adventuresomeness, understandably, that then can sometimes be overly restricted, understandably, and bound up. Well, today, would it be possible? For example, to bring more of that playfulness and adventure sumness into your life today. What might happen if you did that? So I'm going to check out a couple more things and I'll swing back. I'll start with you, Marie, uh, and then I'll come back here. Yeah. So Paula at 7 p.m. makes the comment, I think it was around nine years old that I somehow began to get the feelings and messages that I should protect my mom from her own fears and insecurities. It felt like a ton of pressure that informed my life a lot. One thing that also can often start to happen by nine, if not sooner, is we can become, kind of a phrase, the parentified child. 
We become a kind of parent to our parents. I served some of those functions for my mom in particular, who was pretty unhappy and, and lonely, I think, in some ways um, in her own marriage. So, uh, you know, one thing that can happen too when we look back, what kind of roles or shoulds did you take on? Like for me, being a good boy, that was a big one. I'm still trying to loosen up there. And also, um, you know, being uh, uh, performing well, being good in school, performing well, not doing the wrong thing, part of being a good boy. Ugh, you know, is there some unlearning to do, some shucking of the husks we acquired, understandably, again, including a sense of caretaking uh, for other people? Also, as Brenda points out at seven o'clock, what about sexual fantasies? I had lots of them at that age, wanting so much to be a grown woman, fantasizing with my closest girlfriend about what sex really was. No one talked about it openly. That was certainly true in my own home. You know, it was a disappeared topic in the, you know, my parents grew up in, you know, the depression, they were straight laced and this was not a subject we, we talked about and, and still, under the surface is all this primal stuff, totally normal. Um, you know, just intensities, passions, anger, sexuality, sensuality. Maybe it's not yet sexualized, although um, sexuality in early childhood is not at all uncommon. Um, and uh, so uh, can what, what was our relationship to that? And today, are there things that were your passions of various kinds when you were younger that you are really wanting to dust off increasingly today. For example, for me, one of my passions was to be alone in the wild. I loved that. Now the wild for me was more like deep into the orange groves where it was quiet and nobody was there. And when you're nine years old, that feels pretty wild. These old, old trees smell of the leaves, the smell of the oranges on the ground, you know, and then the hills around my home. Alone in the wild, that was a passion. And I'm trying to dust that off. I've been unable to really live that one out until pretty recently, and I'm making more room for that in my life. How about you? Passions for you of many, many kinds. Okay, so let's see. Marie, I'm gonna ask you, and by the way, I appreciate you going along with me on this ride. This ride is playful and adventuresome to explore these topics in this Buddhist-y kind of framework. Okay, Marie. I'm asking you to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Great. Hi, Marie. Hi, Rick. Um, I'm Marie. It's my first time here. Thank you oh. for this space. Oh, well, thank you for jumping in. Mm -hmm. um, so I noticed a lot of participants mentioned childhood trauma in the chat. Yeah. And I have to admit that I have some hard feelings about having survivors to practice healing work and meditation I know all of you here really don't mean to blame victims, but I feel bad people are the people that need therapy. And when there's justice, the victims will feel better already. And so I'm an immigrant from East Asia and there is strong Buddhist culture. And I was under the impression that the Buddhist culture seems to put more weight on self-reflection and less weight on external intervention into the bad things. So for example, in the, in the culture I grew up in, child abuse is not recognized to be wrong because children are assets of parents. So I can't help but feel there is some tacit approval from some of the religious communities. And so maybe I don't really have a question, but would like to hear your comments. Well, Marie, you have raised a number of issues and opened several cans of worms. No, all at once here. Uh, so uh, I've got a few, uh, and I, all of which I think is good. So let me make, see if I can respond. Um, <clears throat> first, I'm offering my own personal story and my own approach, really, that comes from Western American culture. For me as a white, cisgender, heterosexual man, you know, in this culture has certain implications and it leaves out many different perspectives. So I, I certainly want to acknowledge that. And um, I think it's very helpful to keep focusing on one's own experience 
and one's own personal process of awakening, uh, including in the chat. And that's one reason why I think it's important to be very careful about um, advising or criticizing or lecturing other people. So that is good. Uh, second, in the there are many Buddhisms. <laughs> there are the original teachings of the Buddha, early Buddhism as best we know in the Pali Canon, and then uh, you know explored today a lot in Southeast Asia, Thailand. I, I don't know what part of Asia you come from, uh, but Southeast Asia. Also, there are cultural influences that move through Tibet, China, Japan, uh, Pure Land teachings, and then Buddhism has moved into the West. And in some of those cultures, there's a view uh, that uh, people's misfortune is the result of misdeeds in previous lives. So they don't get much sympathy for being abused in this life. And it's, it's very easy to move uh, from that view of karma to blaming the victim. Uh, and that, uh, to me, is, is really problematic for a lot of reasons, including the ways in which that's not what the Buddha himself taught, as far as we know. He, he said he believed in rebirth. He taught about rebirth, reincarnation. But he was really clear that what we do in this life um, influences the kind of realm we end up in. Is it a hell realm? Is it a heaven realm? Is it a, another human life? And we carry into that next life certain tendencies that are not yet entirely purified or healed from this life. That's all he said. He never said that, oh, if in this life you were beaten by your father, it was because you were a bad father in your previous life. Never said anything like that. So I, that part. And then more generally, uh, the Buddha himself was not against intervening in the world. He gave advice to people about how they should treat other people, which is intervening in the world, how they should protect their property, and in general terms, you know, to act wisely. But he was not a um, revolutionary in that sense he focused on the on the internal practice but certainly there's nothing if we if we care about suffering and we want to relieve suffering and help people it's entirely appropriate in my view uh, to look for ways to bring water to people who don't have water to bring civil society to people who don't have civil society to bring justice to people who don't have justice that's you know, in my opinion, at least, that's not inconsistent uh, with a Buddhist practice. Um, maybe I'll just leave it there. And and want to I want to thank you actually for raising these points. And you know that if I understood you correctly, in terms of the kind of things you were talking about, you know, these are some points I wanted to make about that. Uh, is that okay? All right. Okay. Thank you, and thanks for coming. That's great. Uh, as a psychologist, too, I'll say one more thing. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the heart of uh, suffering, the, the key root source of suffering is, in the Buddhist frame, ignorance or delusion. And to me, if over 2,500 years, we have acquired a lot of knowledge and a lot of information about um, human psychology and how the the body works, how the body makes the mind. We've learned a lot about that. And we've learned a lot about the impact of early childhood experiences. I cannot find one word, basically, about childhood trauma in the Pali Canon. Just was not understood. There, nor can I find one word about the laws of relativity, <laughs> you know, or the germ theory of medicine. It just wasn't known, you know, or the fact that there are planets out there beyond, you know, Jupiter and Saturn. It wasn't known. Uh, so we know a lot more. And to me, it's completely consistent with Buddhist thinking to draw upon yet more information that can dispel ignorance, can reduce ignorance. 
why not make use of what we've learned about the impact of early childhood experiences and the ways in which, for example, that a child has its own agency, uh, its own consciousness, its own choices, its own uh, personhood. And you know, when we understand in a clearer way the, uh, the fact that children have their own minds, they have their own minds, suddenly we start to treat them with more respect and we start to realize that we have a duty of care to them. So Doris, then Catherine. So Doris, I'm asking you to unmute. And then I'll finish with Catherine and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay, Doris. Hi. So um, being the youngest of 10 kids, um, yep, and uh, lots of drugs and alcohol and um, inappropriate stuff going on. Yeah. But um, I just remember nine was when I started to feel depression. And uh, the teacher at the school that I went to sent a letter home to my mom that I could be, I could use therapy because I seemed depressed. Oh. And so since then, honestly, I've worked really hard at being a positive person, like, you know, the power of positivity from Norman Vincent Peale, you know, mm -hmm. but um, then I, my husband and I just got married a couple of years ago and he's the seventh of nine. And we started talking, you know, big farm families for, we both agreed that we could have disappeared and no one would have noticed. Isn't that amazing? And then now I have a nine-year-old grandson that just in the last year, I noticed he's more serious and not as joyful and playful as he was. So thank you for doing this, Rick. You made us uh, really think a lot about this. And oh, I'm really glad. Oh, that's great. You know, part of it for me, honestly, Doris, was, and everybody really, I was surprised recently with this reflection going back. And I realized my nine-year-old in his own way was a bit of a badass in a good sense. And for me as a goody two-shoes, shy, anxious, contracted kid to realize that that nine-year-old had some moxie. He was clever too. He used his moxie when nobody was watching. <laughs> because you would get in trouble otherwise. And I think there's something really powerful about, um, you can imagine doing this yourself. If you could just hang out with you, you as a nine-year-old, right? And just hang out, spend a day together, just hang out. What good qualities would you see in yourself? And what effect does it have on yourself today to recognize those good qualities that were present in you back then? Yeah. Yeah, great, okay, thank you for that. And good, and then Catherine, I'm asking you to unmute. Yeah, great. Hi. <clears throat> hey. uh, yeah, nine, nine was a rough year too, but I wanted to share something happy that I made a connection about <laughs> with this meditation. Um, I, I'm about to go on a dream trip for about five, six weeks to England and Scotland. Mm. And I grew up during ca drawing castles and princesses. And I think it's the way I coped with the family. And I wanted to escape into this fairy tale realm or something mm. and believed in magic, you know, and now I'm going to go <laughs> and see yeah. some of these places. So what's your so, question? Well, I don't know what I'm trying to get at. I just, uh, you asked, you know, if there's something about our ourselves when we were nine. I mean, remembering the hard side of it, I feel like I was already sort of an old soul who saw through my parents. Mm. I already knew at five, like, who the heck are these people? And I'm, you know. So can I ask you a quick question, Catherine? When you, when you own that, when you own that, it's, I think, a very important moment when you own, wow, I was an old soul. I saw some deep things, probably couldn't talk about them, maybe even had to compartmentalize that knowing. You know, One part of me knew it, one part of me didn't want to know it, but I don't know, but maybe you just knew it through and through. Uh, what's it like right now to recognize yourself as an old soul, even way back then? Well, I just see like I've been, I've been focused on finding authentic relating since I'm a little kid. And it's still hard to find, even at 52. 
What's it like to to recognize that old soulness in yourself? Yeah. That, that oh, I've part. known that for a long time. But to so see that I was it? that way as a kid, yeah, it puts my family in perspective in a different way, for sure. What's it like to recognize this kind of remarkable quality of being an old soul as a as a young kid who saw things clearly? Well, I mean, to me, I don't know what the Buddhist uh, thinking is exactly on this one, but it certainly feels anything. to me like you choose your family. You choose your family for a reason to learn. Do you appreciate the fact that you are an old soul? Yeah. Okay. I'm frustrated on We're getting somewhere. <laughs> You do appreciate it. Yeah, and I just, you know, Catherine, we've talked before. You you, you could take it. Isn't it interesting how hard it was? I had to do that like six times to get you to a place of going, well, yeah, I like that about myself. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, right? Isn't that interesting? <laughs> mm, yeah, true. <laughs> yeah. Well, you sense. know, you have parents that don't see it and never will. Yeah. And part of, I, I think, what's useful in this nine-year-old inquiry is to is to track continuity. Like what have been the major through lines of your life? And I suspect it may well have been for you. It was for me a lot that you saw stuff that other people didn't see and you didn't know what to do about it. And there was a poignance about that, a wistfulness. And still you can recognize, wow, there was a lot of depth and wisdom and maybe old soulness in a rebirth sense. To claim that today and to live from that can be a very valuable thing. Yeah. It's hard to fully own that. It's a lo- It's like a great thing and it's a lonely thing at the same time, right? Yeah. 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 But if it's a true thing, you might as well claim it. <laughs> You're already lonely. <laughs> you might as well own being an, an old wise soul. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I, yeah, and I, I, <laughs> I think for a lot of us, it's to go, okay, wow. It's like to honor the knowing that has been a through line for us. And today with the, you said you, you were 50 or something like that? Yeah, you know, 52. Yeah. To, we have a lot of resources as a 52-year-old. We didn't have when we were nine. Like, you know, but today... How can you support your old soulness, or how how does how does your old soulness want to manifest these days, or what is it? Well, part of what I'm doing in my, on this on this trip is the trying to do some of the ancestral healing that it won't come from the mouths of talking with parents or cousins. It's I'm going straight to the source of the land. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to try to go back and see what I can feel or activate. Because it, it works on some weird way. Um, when I did it before uh, with yeah. my mother's side, now I'm going to the my dad's side. Yeah. You can keep asking. You know, it's interesting to do this little moment, and I'll kind of finish on this point, where we pause inside, and we it's like we ask a question into the silence inside, into the, into the spaciousness. Even And the question might be nonverbal. I mean, I did it internally here with you, Catherine, you know, like it's, it's almost like you, if you were throwing the I Ching, you might ask the question, what wisdom or with regard to, right? And often phrases or words or clear statements will arise that just do not feel like you thought of them. They arise from within you, but it's not like you thought of them. So you might ask yourself, huh? all of you, is there some inner voice of wisdom that can speak to you right now? Forward, we've been looking back, now let's look forward. Things fall apart. Tread your path with care, as the Buddha taught. Thank you. Let's just take a breath here and let it kind of sink in, whatever's been useful. Were you a sweet, good kid when you were nine? I bet you were a sweet, good kid. 
What's it like to just feel that? And that sweet, good kid is still in you today. Yeah. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free.